All right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for sticking around this late in the day. Uh, Danielle, Adrian, and I are extremely excited to share some of our research with you with this, these projects that we're going to be doing little like flash presentations on grew out of a couple of courses that we were taking either together or apart last semester. And some of them relate to dissertation or thesis research. Some of them proved what we should probably not be doing for dissertation or thesis research in my case. Uh, so Danielle is going to go first. Adrian will follow. I will go third. We'll provide a brief moment of synthesis. And then we will open the floor for questions. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Danielle. Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, the kind of title of my paper is Constructing a Mammy. I'm looking at uh, Louise Beavers, Hattie McDaniel, and Ethel Waters. Um, again, my name is Danielle Green. I'm a PhD student um, in film and media studies. So what I did um, was I looked at, uh, I used Lantern um, and looked through the media history uh, digital library in order to look at these three actresses and how um, they're being kind of constructed, how they're being talked about. Um, and so I used uh, Lantern, I used ARC, uh, Project ARC Like, um, in order to look at, to search for their names um, through um, industry publications and uh, fan magazines um, to see in specific years, to see um, in specific publications how they're being talked about, um, what is being talked about about uh, these specific actresses as people, um, and also in their films as well. Um, so one of the main things with um, my study was that uh, these, all three of them play the kind of mammy character, right? Um, and so kind of common tropes of the mammy is that um, she's typically very independent. Um, her physical appearance is very, very much so um, a part of how she's understood, a part of how she's uh, looked at. Um, so she's typically overweight. Um, she's typically considered unattractive. Um, and so uh, there are kind of levels of the, the mammy character. So the Aunt, Aunt Jemima um, comes off of the, the mammy. Aunt Jemima is um, a little bit more good tempered. The mammy um, is a little bit more feisty. Um, they both typically wear like an apron um, and a bandana. They're very much so associated with maids. So they're, they're, they're serving. Um, typically, they're uh, white families, okay? Um, and then also associated with the mammy, um, particularly earlier, um, is the picking any children um, who's, uh, she's taking care of all of these children. Um, and that's more associated with um, kind of the, so, the South um, and plantation mammy, okay? And so typically her role in film is the comic relief. Um, she adds kind of a splash of comedy to uh, other the the films, the other more serious elements of the film. Um, and so, within the as I looked at the publications and as I, as I looked at um, the way that they're talking about these the the mammy characters, the these women, um, the authenticity of their characters and the authenticity of their um, roles as servants, the roles as maids, is key to how they're constructed. Okay, so um, the three, again, that I looked at were Ethel Waters, Louise Beavers, and Hattie McDaniel. Um, Ethel Waters is, um, and these, these images are the ones that uh, often show up. Okay, so um, with Ethel Waters, they're, they're all um, have similar body builds. Um, they, uh, in, in the, the images that are shown, um, especially from the films, um, as like, you know, advertisements or um, as uh, text that go along with the film, um, they're usually wearing the kind of tattered clothing and bandanas um, to kind of go along with their characters. 
Um, and so again, Ethel Waters, she's um, known for Cabin in the Sky. Um, she uh, is, was also a jazz blues singer. Um, and so a part of her, the, um, as I looked at um, Project Arclight um, and searched for her, her name in some of these uh, publications, part of her, her rise within this um, within the media that are available on this system. Um, her rise occurs during that, um, that Cabin in the Sky period when she's playing Cabin in the Sky. So they're talking a little bit more about her. Okay. Um, Louise Beavers um, is known for imitation of life. Um, so she is uh, pictured here with uh, Freddie Washington. Um, and much of her, the way that she uh, is constructed within these publications is that she is, uh, again, constructed as the mammy. She's um, talked about as very much so um, being uh, within the maid uh, role in real life. Um, she's talked about as having a, a uh, authentic um, servant turbitude, essentially. Um, Hattie McDaniels also talked about in that way. Um, with these three actresses, though, they played um, their roles differently. They played, personified these roles differently. Um, and so with Ethel Waters, she often was um, kind of contrary to what they wanted to construct her as. So oftentimes, she um, was not one to offer um, a, a uh, interview that is going to talk about how much she loves, loves to cook. Um, she's not going to offer an interview that talks about um, uh, how she worked for this uh, family, how much she loved the family's children. Typically, her, um, her presentation in some of these, these articles early on was about her blues performances, was about reviews of her jazz performances. Um, and then later, her voice is primarily just erased. Um, and so they talk about um, her within, this image is, is from Pinky, um, but they talk about her within these, these films, but her voice is, is not there. OK, um, Louise Beavers. Um, has a little bit more voice, but it's it's very much so kind of selective, um, and so her the there are a couple interviews where she talks about how she didn't like uh, the way that she looked in the first film that she did um, because in comparison to other women who were smaller in frame, um, she said she couldn't fit in uh, some sort of. Uh, outfit, those didn't work for her because she was bigger. Um, and so they emphasized her weight, 189 pounds they put in the articles. Um, and so her appearance is, uh, her appearance is very much so um, pushed forward, um, but her appearance as the mammy, as the overweight, common, commonly overweight um, caricature is emphasized. Um, and Louise Beavers um, kind of played the game. Um, so she, she would offer some of these insights in the interviews. Um, but she was also very active um, in terms of she would not play. Uh, she played the role, but she would not allow certain words, um, such as the N-word, to be used as she's, as she's in films that she's in. Okay, um, Hattie McDaniel um, is one that's kind of on the other end. She was the first African-American woman to win an Oscar. Um, and that was for Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And Hattie McDaniel has significantly uh, more uh, of her voice being uh, portrayed in the publications. Um, and so they have full articles on how much she loves to cook and where, she, um, where you can find her recipes. They have her recipes on the, in, printed in the, the publications. And so she very much so played into that um, Mammy role. Um, and so with uh, Lantern and with uh, Arclight, I was able to look um, much more easily than um, had I gone to uh, an archive or a physical archive looking through 
um, these publications. Um, it w I was allowed to search through and search for specific terms. So I searched for Ethel Waters, uh, Louise Beavers, Hattie McDaniel, and also Mammy, um, uh, and use those terms to kind of try to figure out um, how they're being constructed within these, uh, these publications. Um, one of the major things is that within what is available on the Media History uh, Digital Library, um, there are a couple things that are missing. Of course, their, their voices are uh, excluded if they are not playing into their, their mammy characters. Um, but also, uh, the Chicago Defender is one uh, newspaper that is often, often quoted um, and cited as uh, one that kind of put their voice out there. Um, and so that, those, the articles that um, in the Chicago, from the Chicago Defender that uh, talk about these films and talk about um, their roles in the films and more of the actresses' uh, beliefs uh, behind that are excluded from this. Um, and so that part of that is, is uh, kind of uh, how the Mammy is continued to be constructed within these, um, for these actresses. Um, and so part of the main major part of the study and the major thing that I'm looking at is how, how these stories are being told, um, who uh, in terms of publications, who in terms of authors are telling these stories and are telling us about um, these actresses. Um, and so I want to transfer over to Adrian um, for the next presentation. Hi, my name is Adrienne Frank. I'm a master's student in the Film and Media Studies Department. Um, I'm going to be talking about maintaining the sovereignty of the virtual reservation in a colonized space, the problematic aspects of allyship and activism in indigenous film exhibition, which is an incredibly long title. <laughs> so what that means is um, I'm looking at the idea of visual sovereignty in indigenous film. I'm also looking at allyship to activist causes and activist film exhibition, and where all three of those topics intersect and how they work together and um, affect one another. So I've drawn significantly from uh, Michelle Raheja's Reservation Realism, and she discusses in her book the concepts of visual sovereignty and the virtual reservation. And so she writes about, um, concerning indigenous film, that visual sovereignty is a way of reimagining native-centered articulations of self-representation and autonomy that engage the powerful ideologies of mass media. So it's taking the, the idea of sovereignty and applying it to media and film. And then she goes on to discuss the concept of this leading to a virtual reservation, um, which is, she uh, defines it as a creative kinetic open space where indigenous artists collectively and individually employ technologies and knowledges to rethink the relationship between media and indigenous communities. And so it's discussed quite a bit about the films themselves. It's also been written about some concerning the production of the films. But what I wanted to look at was how exhibition plays a role in this and whether or not um, at certain exhibition practices can impact retaining this sense of visual sovereignty and retaining this idea of the virtual reservation. So I had to look quite a bit at allyship and the problematic aspects to allyship or potentially problematic. Um, there's quite a bit of writing about uh, allyship potentially centering whiteness and serving as a quick fix for some complex issues. And as there's been a big influx in activist film exhibition, especially in independent exhibition, so like art house movie theaters, for example, attempting to use exhibition as a way to be an ally to an activist cause. And I have been looking at the feasibility or potentially lack thereof of film exhibition serving as a form of activism. So what I wanted to look at is what other aspects impact this concept of the virtual reservation beyond the film itself? So we, we think about this idea of the virtual reservation existing in the digital space of the screen and that that's where the story is being told. And I wanted to look at everything else that goes around the screen that impacts what story is being told. And so the, these are, this is not um, 
all the things that I think could go into this conversation, but obviously things such as the film selection, who is actually selecting the film, who is on a programming team, um, how is the film being branded? You know, is it, how is it being marketed? Is it being considered activist? Is that how the theater or festival is, is marketing it? Or are they marketing it as educational or entertainment? And then what, um, what those preconceived notions for the audience, how that impacts the way they're going to view the story that's on the actual screen itself. Um, funding is another big element to this, especially in, um, a lot of independent exhibition, a lot of it is nonprofit. Um, I come from a background in exhibition and I've seen how much sponsorship can impact programming choices that are made and who your sponsors are and what they wanna see in the program. And so funding can, can play a large role in what films are selected, but also how they're packaged. Um, also who the target audiences are. Um, a lot of um, Rahija's writing about the virtual reservation discusses this idea of um, indigenous media not necessarily having to be for a non-indigenous audience. And so what, what do we do when we're trying to create it for quite often a non-indigenous audience? How does that impact what story is being told on the screen? Um, additionally, community partnerships. You know, who are we partnering with in the community that impacts the, the telling of the story? You know, are the, are the theaters partnering with um, local indigenous communities or is that not a part of the, the process? as well as um, panelists, expert, potentially expert panelists. Um, if there are Q&A sessions after a film, that can greatly impact how an audience might perceive what they just saw in the film. And so I wanted to look at all of these different aspects that, that kind of swirl around the movie itself and how they impact what story is being told. Um, it, I feel like if it's the goal of exhibitors to ally themselves with indigenous causes in hopes of creating this space of visual sovereignty, um, we need to recognize that that space extends beyond the screen. And what other aspects are going on in the space of a theater, in the space of a festival that impact what is being told on the screen itself? Yeah, and I will turn it over to Anne. If I can get that. I'm just gonna hold it. All right, so I know we're running short on time, so I will make sure that we go as quickly as possible. And I am going to present some of my work, which is a very big shift. I approach everything almost entirely as like as theoretically as possible, but this project comes out of a methods class. And uh, I learned that I'm not very good at methods, but I did have a lot of fun looking at digital comics. Uh, so I'm going to talk about who you are just might determine what you read. Uh, a little brief note on my methods. I started out by wanting to use the walkthrough method, which is meant to look specifically at the cultural uh, and societal ways that an application or a piece of technology has been constructed. So you're going through it uh, from the download phase all the way through the closing phase, playing around with it and sort of seeing the way cultural scripts are being represented through this piece of technology or through the application. Uh, however, I felt that there was something very much missing from that, which was this element of time. You sort of do the walkthrough method once, but then you can't see how an application shifts uh, as it is uh, marketed differently, but also as it relates to changes within the actual design and development. Uh, so I decided to do a tactile ethnography, which emphasized my actual interactions with the media through uh, specifically my hand, uh, but I also brought in a little bit of phenomenology. So I was looking at the crick of my neck after I'd been staring at a screen for 20 minutes and you know my cats running over my feet as I was conducting my research from bed. This was a very luxurious project. Um, but I also brought in autoethnography as well so I could look at the effects of personal identity on technology, devices, and access. Uh, I also specifically looked at digital comics, e-comics, and scans as well, and sort of used this as a way of differentiating between the different types of digital comics. Uh, so if you use the Scott McCloud definition, you start out with a comic as being a story told specifically through pictures as the primary medium or the primary device for telling the story. After a literature review, I came up with a very unhelpful definition of the digital comic as a uh, any story or comic made, produced, or distributed 
through digital means, which means most of the comics we've been working with really since the 80s could be considered digital. But luckily, Lucas Vilda uh, breaks it down into the three different types. So there's web comics, which are produced specifically to be read online. We also have scans, which would just be an actual scan of the page. And then we also have e-comics, which are specifically meant to be distributed through an application such as Comixology, which is the application I ended up using for this project. Uh, and then we also have a lot of discourse surrounding digital comics, which deals with remediation. Is this just moving something somewhere else and doing it in exactly the same way without any sort of extra nuance added? Uh, and this is quite a contentious conversation within digital comics scholarship, and specifically Jeremy Kirchhoff, uh, or Jeffrey Kirchhoff, uh, talks about how there are oftentimes not new modalities for the new medialities. Uh, he says that a lot of digital comics are still very much within this point and click mentality, that you still have page ends or the end of the page, the turn of the page as the cliffhanger to the action that will be happening on the next part of the page. Uh, and there's also only one size for viewing all of this. So one of my arguments in the paper was that what we miss are the affordances offered by the application through which we are actually reading the digital comic. As you can see up here, Comixology offers what is called Guided View, which offers a lot of the features that Kirchhoff was hoping we would have. It fundamentally shifts the way that we read the comic by giving us this very cinematic zooming in, this swift motion, and it also works much better than instead of the point and click, much more the swipe of the finger, which is becoming popular with a lot of digital technology. And it also allows very much for a zoom in on a specific panel. Uh, and it doesn't require that you get out a magnifying glass and do it in that way. So now that we sort of know what a digital comic is, we can talk a little bit more about the access. Uh, so I was specifically interested in looking at affordability. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, we've got these digital comics, so they are so much easier for people to afford, which, yes, in some ways, the prices do go down for the digital medium. However, you also then have to have a computer or an iPad or some sort of other device which has its own access problems. Uh, digital comics are oftentimes thought of as being very flexible. You can spill things on them, and while you don't ruin the comic, you might ruin your iPad, uh, but at least you still have a comic that you can read later. Uh, but they also allow you to read in a variety of different locations, uh, which also then functions or factors into geographic location as well. Uh, Amalgam Comics opened in December 2015. It's the first black run comic shop in the United States. Uh, and the owner, uh, Ariel Johnson, specifically talked about how she wanted to have this space as a place where she herself could feel safe reading comics, but also could do it with a sense of community there that is not always a part of the digital comic experience because you don't necessarily have to go to a comic shop anymore. So that's one of the things that's oftentimes lost with digital comics. Uh, and as Gail Simone talked about as well, uh, oftentimes rural individuals or individuals living in a rural community are not considered when it comes to comic book sales because they can't access them in the same way. So having digital comics allows people who live in an area without uh, a comic book store to access things that they might not have had before. I know we are out of time, so thank you very much. So Lantern and Arclight, um, essentially, the media, let's start with the media history, uh, digital library. Um, so within this uh, digital library, um, Eric Hoyt um, and some other collaborators uh, decided to essentially digitize um, some of these publications. So film publications um, that are industry press, but also uh, fan magazines. Um, and so the basic uh, premise behind it um, is having access to, especially as researchers, having access to um, historical um, presses that are not, you don't have to go to a physical um, archive or you don't have to um, look through millions of pages in microfilm in order to find what you're looking for. Um, and so Lantern and Project Arclight 
allow you to search through these digitized publications um, in order to do your research more efficiently um, and a little bit more effectively. Um, so I focused more so on um, exhibitors, and so I've been looking at various movie theaters that run indigenous film showcases. So I was looking at the Northwest Film Forum, which is one in Seattle. That's one that I've been looking at quite a bit to see how they construct their series, which is an ongoing um, series throughout the year. I've also looked at um, the uh, Native Filmmakers Program at Sundance. Um, and a variety of other um, festivals. It's primarily film festivals and um, independent art house movie theaters. So I've been approaching it primarily from that standpoint, like from the exhibitors and then seeing how they package the films. Uh, and for me, I looked at a variety of different comics, but I ended up being more interested in the comicsology application than the comics themselves. I did walkthroughs of a free issue that was a history of Captain America, and that was what some of the pictures were from. But I also did a number of walkthroughs with various is issues of my favorite indie comic, which is Bitch Planet, which is currently run by Image uh, and is done by the phenomenal Kelly Sue DeConnick. It's a really fascinating feature, so it's not one that is always enabled within the app. Once you go into it, you can say, I want to use the guided view feature, and then every time you swipe, it will do that swoop and zoom in on the next panel, and then at the end of it, it will actually zoom out so you can see the entire page and sort of see how everything fits through. It does have some positive side effects, like helping individuals sort of navigate through, uh, but it can also be seen as kind of panoptic in a way as well, in this sort of Foucauldian way of guiding your view in a way that is set by the programmers rather than the reader themselves. So I am a nerd, and I have been <laughs> reading comics for a number of years, but uh, part of the presentation I didn't get to is I have spent most of my life living in a town of 500 people, uh, and the closest comic book store was typically an hour away. I was able to get access to comic books through the local public libraries, so yay libraries, and uh, when I finally had a little bit of disposable income, I decided I wanted to be able to start supporting some of my favorite creators, and I wanted to do that digitally because I've also moved around a lot, so having a digital collection was a lot easier than having to lug hundreds of comics all the way around the country and potentially internationally. So uh, the app came out in, I think, 2013 and then was later bought by Amazon. And I started using it in 2014 and found it, I think, just through a, a post maybe on the Mary Sue as, this is the new thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I know there was one hand in the back. Yeah, so the way that um, Rahasia had written about it in the book that I've utilized um, for my paper quite a bit was that it's a, essentially like a reclaiming of this idea of the reservation to create a sovereign space for indigenous media. Um, does, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah, time's up. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.